בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, new faces, old faces, בעזרת השם, we are uh, back here in Aventura, Florida, doing our Erev Mashiach series, we are in part number three, so far, ברוך השם, the first two have been big hits, lots of people are waking up, lots of people are getting some new insights of uh, what is the world supposed to look like right before the Mashiach arrives, as uh, was written by the great sage, Arav Alchanan Wasanen, Alav HaShalom. Uh, today, Bezot Hashem, the shiur will be for a refuah shlema for Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, Sara Bat Levana, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, David Ben Nesriya, Doris Bat Jora, uh, Esther Bat Zipora, Dvora Bat Mercedes, Itro Ben uh, Avraham, Serach Bat Batya, Batya Bat uh, Sara, and all of Am Yisrael, Bezot Hashem, will have a refuah shlema, refuah ta'nefesh, refuah ta'guf. So, as uh, I'm sure uh, anyone that still spends any time connected to society uh, knows that uh, in the last few days there's been uh, mayhem happening all over the United States where uh, thousands or tens of thousands of hooligans have decided to uh, destroy public property, uh, almost kill people, um, just uh, create as much havoc and damage as you can possibly see. And a few, qu a few people are uh, asking questions about this. You know, you see them uh, going into uh, Jewish communities and non-Jewish communities alike. You know, you can't say that they're only going to Jewish communities, but unfortunately, we can say that they are going to them. Uh, the uh, number of videos are sent to me already. I uh, watched three short ones of just different damage that they're doing everywhere, whether it be in uh, Washington or in California, New York, uh, many, many other places. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you're literally seeing that these people are acting as an organized group, although they're making a very big public mess, it looks like they're extremely organized and well put together. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I would say that scarier than the amount of damage they're causing, whether they're breaking into jewelry stores and supermarkets and just robbing them of everything that's in sight, causing the owners uh, you know, countless damage and, and, and losses, which of course the insurance companies do not want to cover. So you're talking about uh, damage that people in many cases are not going to be able to pay for. So if the coronavirus loss uh, you know, lack of business or no business whatsoever over the last few months, if that wasn't enough, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Ishtabach Shemol Ha'ad is sending another Makkah. He's sending another plague. And he's uh, putting some Ruach Shtut, some uh, impure thought, foolish thought, uh, from the Yetzirah into people's minds in order to create even more havoc in the world. Uh, and if, you know, of course, you can say yes, but that's because a police officer, uh, a white police officer, and uh, some say there was a couple of others, uh, you know, killed a, a, a black guy that was uh, innocent and, uh, you know, had no mercy. Yeah, you're right, 100%. These police officers should go to jail and stay there for the rest of their life. And if I was in the, the, the head of the, uh, of, of the uh, court, chas v'shalom, I would simply give them a death penalty. There's no, no question about that. But what does the jewelry store have to do with it? What does the supermarket have to do with it? What are the countless cars, buildings, and, and other things that have nothing to do with this police officer and don't even know who he is until he was on the news as a, shown as a murderer, what do they have to do with it? Nothing. But don't let the facts get in the way of a good argument. And that's what the Rishayim say. The Rishayim are just looking for an argument no matter whether it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. But this is, make no mistake about it, 
a plague from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's not from anybody else. This is 100% from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And as we will learn today, we are at fault. We are at fault for all of it. We as a people, not just as Jews, but as society. Needless to say as Jews, but as society as large, we are at fault 100% for this happening. Now you can say, yeah, but I didn't tell the guy to go do it. No, you didn't tell him to go do it. You taught him how to do it. You didn't tell him to go do it. But you gave him an educational system that taught him that this is what you do when you're frustrated with stuff. This is what you do when you just feel like doing whatever you want. When you want to beat the man. You want to beat the system. You're frustrated with the system. Now you would say, yeah, I'm probably a bunch of frustrated homeless people, a bunch of frustrated poor people, you know, don't have any money. Wrong. Wrong, completely wrong. The overwhelming large majority of them are middle class or better. Mm. This is not uh, poor people's problem. Poor people are too busy trying to make money so they can survive. This is middle class, upper class, mefunakim, spoiled people that don't like how society has treated them. And they're right to a certain extent as far as how society has treated them, but they're not right in how they're behaving. But unfortunately, they do not have the Torah. They never utilized it. So the only set of instructions that they have is their feelings and their frustrations. But that's our fault. Why? We have an educational system that has failed several generations in a row and has taught people to become absolutely animals. In fact, this is actually, I'm sorry to the animals. No, I'm wrong. It's not the animals. Animals are actually very nice. As long as you don't bother them, take their food. They're very nice to you. They comply. They do Ritzon Hashem. They do the will of Hashem. If it's a lizard, it acts like a lizard. It doesn't act like a cat. If it's a dog, it acts like a dog. It doesn't act like an elephant. It doesn't say, no, listen, mister, uh, I don't want to be a dog anymore. I want to be a dancer. It doesn't say that. I don't want to be a, uh, you know, a male dog. I want to be a uh, female dog. And I want to go teach about being a female dog, even though I'm a male dog, in a kindergarten. doesn't do that. You're never going to see a dog like that. You're never going to see a monkey complain about how his friend, his long-lost friend that he now hates, you know, why does he hate him? Because he unliked him on Facebook. He unfriended him on Facebook. Or he didn't give him enough likes. You're never going to see a monkey do that. People, you're going to see that. You're going to actually see entire families break apart because somebody didn't like their post or somebody disagreed with what they said publicly, privately, doesn't really make a difference anymore. Or if somebody unliked a page that they happen to like or if somebody supports a president that they don't support and you see literally entire families break apart. There's actually even a famous story of two stupid celebrities in Eretz Israel, where this actually went on on national TV. On national TV, where a couple, both of them were celebrities, broke up and both families went into an absolute war. Why? Because the husband or the boyfriend or whatever he was, he unliked her page. He didn't want to follow her page anymore. Her celebrity page anymore. Oh, wah, oh, wah, oh, wah. War, war. On TV. Broke up the marriage, broke up the families, enemies, all types of things. Why? How could you unlike me? How could you do this? This is... What's going to happen? People are going to go up to Shemaim and instead of Divrei Torah, Instead of divrei chokhmah, instead of Torah, instead of wisdom, what are they going to have in their head? Likes. Likes and unlikes. That's what they're going to have in their head. How many likes you have? How many posts? How many shares? How many retweets? How many pukits, utitits, and tiktoks, and pickpocks, and all the stupid things that people base their entire life on? That's what they're going to go up to Shemaim with. And then they're going to be surprised that they ain't getting home. No, no, Rabbi, there's no gain on. Did you ever read? Did, did you ever verify this opinion of yours? No, I just don't believe in it. Okay, I don't believe in traffic laws. So I'm just going to drive a thousand miles an hour. 
I'm going to borrow Elon Musk's uh, uh, rocket. I'm going to go on, tra on traffic in there, okay? I don't believe in traffic law. And I don't believe in tax law. And I don't believe in legal law. And I don't believe in any law. So I'm just going to do what I want. And that's going to be okay? Oh, no, Rabbi, you can't do that. You're going to get arrested. Oh, that's so what? So, the, so you can have enough logic to realize that you can't just do what you want in this world, but you think that what a Kadosh Baruch Hu, the king of kings, the Melech Malchei Amlachim HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you can do whatever you want, and you're not going to have to pay the bill. Without even verifying what you said. Without even having any facts. But people think that they can just do whatever they want because this world allows them to do whatever they want many times. They could act like beasts and show their business in the middle of the street, walk around like animals with no clothes. They could act like beasts and take advantage of each other and just steal stuff from each other thinking that, you know, this is like the jungle. Only the survive, only the strong survive. Everyone has become a lion. They steal from each other, they cheat each other, they break each other's stuff with no care in the world. Oh, that was yours? Ah, yeah, no. I didn't like it. Yeah, but you broke it. Can you pay for it? Oh, no, I didn't mean to break it. So, you know, I didn't mean to. So, right? I don't owe you anything, right? I didn't mean to break it. I didn't mean to. St I didn't mean. It doesn't matter if you didn't mean. It was his stuff. You took it. You broke it. You have to pay for it. Oh, I didn't mean to. Okay. In Shemaim, they're going to say, we meant to. We meant to. We meant to. We meant, to. We meant everything they're going to get. We meant to. As the Pasuk says, Ivelet Adam Tisalev Darkov Al Adonai is Aflibo. Shlomo Amelech says, the stupidity of man causes him to sin, and then he gets mad at Hashem for punishing him. He gets mad of punishing him. But then somebody came to the Rambam years ago and says, Kvodarav, how come it doesn't say the word Gehenom in the Torah? You know, it says other words, which anyone that watched our shiu about, uh, about Gehenom knows that the Torah has seven names for Gehenom in the Torah. We learn one of them in Parashat Korach. You know, but the point is, but the word Gehenom itself, how come it doesn't say, you do bad, you're going to go to Gehenom? Like, how come it doesn't just say outright? How come? The Rambam gives a very simple answer. He says, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is smarter than you. So what did he do? He told you, you don't have to worry so much about Gehenom. Why? I'm going to bring Gehenom to you, here, in this world. Look at Parashat Kitavo. Look at Parashat Bechukotai. Look at Parashat Azinu. Look at Parashat Noach. Look at Parashat with Avraham Avinu, Lech Lecha. Look at Parashat with Solomon Gomorrah, Tower of Babel. Look at the Parashat with Meraglim. Look at more than half of the Torah that talks about punishment. In this world. Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to bring it to you in this world. You're going to suffer in this world. And if you don't like it, you treat me with casualness, I'll bring more. And more, and more, and more, until you eat your kids. Because you're going to be starving to death. How about that? How about that, Geno? Well, why are you saying it like that? It sounds so mean. It's not mean. It says it at all. Nothing mean about it. Kadosh Baruch Hu is saying simply, don't make sins. Don't act like a hooligan. Don't break other people's stuff. Just because you're frustrated, there are ways to do things. But we have a responsibility not only to rebuke others, we have a responsibility to rebuke ourselves. So the question is, how are we at fault? I don't believe anybody in this room or anyone that's watching was in one of these protest breaking stuff. I think the worst crime any of us has made is maybe share one of those videos with somebody else and scare them to death about something that may be happening in a different city or even down the block. Nobody's causing any damage to other people. So how are we at fault? We didn't break anything. We didn't tell them to do anything. Rabbi Hanan Wasserman, Allah Shalom, is telling us, Rabotai, Rabotai, the war has begun. Everyone has talked about the war of Gog and Magog that's described by the prophets, such as Ezekiel, such as Zachariah, Anyone that wants to know that some interesting, scary details, you go to Zechariah chapter 14 of how he talks about 
where people's bodies will melt and their eyes will become liquid at a time that there wasn't even guns. But needless to say, anyone that has ears and a brain attached to them will know that that means a nuclear and most likely a biochemical war. Several thousand years before any of these things were invented. So everyone has talked about Gogu Magog, myself included. And we've all been waiting for someone to pull the trigger, some atomic bomb, some missile, some planes, some aircraft carrier, choppers, tanks, all types of stuff. Rav Wasam and Aleva Shalom says, that will happen. But the war begins before that. The war before Mashiach will actually arrive begins during the era of Mashiach. The Ikvita de Mashiach. In his Sefer that we have on our website, bezatashem.org, you can download for free in both Hebrew and English. He goes into the next section of this letter. During the first two sections, he talked to us about how the world is going to be. At the time of Mashiach, there's going to be a generation of upside-down mentality, lots of heretics, lots of idol worship. Last week he told us about how virtually the entire society in the world, everyone in the world, could be guilty of idol worship whether it's idol worship to Yoshke from Christianity and Catholicism, or it's idol worship at your local dentist office that has a bunch of Buddha statues, or it's idol worship to some cow or monkey or, or a snake or some other cult-like mentality in uh, India and other places around the world, or it's idol worship of your rabbi, that died or is alive or it's idol worship of your money that you have or that you don't have and you want or you lost and you want back or it's idol worship of some female or male that you want to be with to such an extent of obsession or it's idol worship of things like a car or a watch or a sports team or some stupid, you know, uh, secular study like a, uh, the people that waste their lives on all of these things and make a whole career out of philosophy and distort their brain so much so they become a rabbi philosopher like a manis. That's also idolatry. So last week he told us, idolatry comes in all forms and sizes. It's no surprise that the Gemara in Masechet Abu Dazara says that Abraham Avinu had a tractate of Masechet Abu Dazara that is bigger than our entire Shas today. Both Yerushalmi and Babli together. Why? Because Abu Dazara, idol worship, is not just the obvious statue. It's simply giving anything power independent from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When you think that anyone else in the world, whether it be your boss, or your spouse, or your child, or your enemy, or your friend, or your government, or your employees, or your customer, anyone is in control of something that will happen to you, that is idol worship. Not avak idol worship. Not the dust of idol worship. But idol worship mamash according to Rav Wasserman. Why? En od milvado. There's nothing else but him. Nothing other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Believing that anything in the world has power independent of Hashem, idol worship. You don't have to be a Christian to be an idol worshiper. You don't have to be a Buddhist to be an idol worshiper. You could be a Jew with a nice long beard, a hat up to the ceiling. Idol worship mamash. Why? Worship money, worship your rabbi, worship all types of things. So Rav Wasserman says society, because of their lack of Torah and affluence and ignorance, 
is going to be majority idol worshippers. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to be fed up with it. Fed up with it so much that he's going to create havoc in the world. Now, in part three, he calls it the deeds of, our fa of the fathers. Ma'ase avot. And in essence, in this section, he tells us that not only how we got here, but how this is the war. This is the beginning of the war before the big explosion. This is the war that's not killing two-thirds of the world in a matter of seconds like Zachariah describes where the Gaumi Vilna says that two-thirds of the world will die in a matter of 11 minutes. Some say nine minutes. Either way, it's very short. No. Wasserman is saying this is killing a lot more than two-thirds. This is killing the vast majority of people without even knowing that they're dead. You see a bunch of corpses with eyes and ears and know how to speak. But in the eyes of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, dead. He's going to tell us that not only how we got here, but how this is indeed the war. And he begins the following. He says, Mao pirusho shelabitui Torah. Torah limud mishma. Mishema, shekol mila u mila ba Torah limud hi. Acheret en mekuma ba Torah mutzdak. What is the meaning of the expression Torah? Torah means learning. Every word of the Torah must contain a lesson. Otherwise, its place in the Torah is not justified. Now, when you delve into this simple sentence, you realize that you could literally make a shi'u from now until the end of the world, back to the beginning and then the end of the world, and not finish. When you truly understand what he just told us. Arav Wasserman is simply telling you this. You see, the Torah, it's not a novel. It's not some story somebody wrote just for your entertainment purposes. It's also not just simply an instruction set as far as the laws themselves. There's much more than that. There's also stories in it. There's a history in it. What is it really? He sees Torah is divine. And what does it mean it's divine? It means that every single word, word in the Torah, not every sentence, not every paragraph, not every uh, parasha, Every word in the Torah has such significant meaning and so many lessons to learn from that you could literally learn a single word in the Torah for your entire life and still not finish. And if you cannot learn from that word that HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself wrote in the Torah, that word does not belong in the Torah. Meaning, there is no such thing. Every word in the Torah has lessons to learn from. Needless to say, sentences, needless to say, paragraphs, needless to say, a parasha, needless to say, the stories. He's going into the obvious. So much so, Rabbutai, that the Allah tells us that if you have a Sefer Torah, you have a Torah scroll, and Baruch Hashem, we had the merit to have somebody write a Torah scroll, years ago, and it took him approximately a year to write this Torah scroll. Now, when he explained it to me, how he wrote it, and what he has to do, and dip in the mikveh, and have certain thoughts, and this and that, to me, it was so fascinating, and still is. But I never really understood, what's the big deal? What is all of this? Until he told me this. He said, you know, in a Torah scroll, there are hundreds of thousands of letters 
hundreds of thousands of letters, over 300,000 letters in the Torah, 305,000. Letters in the Torah, 304,805. Letters in the Torah. Lots of letters. Lots. Now, if that entire Torah scroll, you wrote it and you toiled on it, and every day a few more letters, and every day a few more sentences, and every day you're doing and doing and doing and doing and doing and doing. Out of all 300,000 letters, if one letter, even if it's the smallest letter like the Yud, which to a, you know, a person that doesn't know how to speak Hebrew and doesn't even know what Hebrew looks like, if you show them the letter Yud, it looks more like a comma than it does a letter. Just that it's in the middle of the line rather than the bottom of the line. Tiny little thing. And the way some people draw it, it looks more like a dot sometimes. He says, this yud, this little tiny yud, if one yud is missing from the entire 305,000 letters, the whole scroll is worthless. Not allowed to read from it. Not allowed to study. Nothing. Worthless. You can throw it like a football. And that's how they, by the way, when they write Torah scrolls and they send them on a plane, that's how they do it. How can, if, if a Sefer Torah, Chas Shalom, a kosher Sefer Torah, falls, everybody that saw it has to fast. It's a very, very big ason, very, very big tragedy if a Sefer Torah falls. Needless to say, if the Nazis in Machshimam burn them or all of these other terrorists decide to burn these Sefer Torah, obviously it's a huge tragedy for us. But if a single letter is missing from it, it's not considered a Sefer Torah. Meaning one letter, it's no longer the same thing. No longer the same thing. It's like saying, if you have a person, and one of his hairs on his head, you know, fell off. You know what happens every day? We lose some hair. We lose some hair every day. It's like we're shedding like every day. So imagine if somebody told you, no, if one hair falls out of your beard, you're no longer the same guy. You're a different person. You're no longer Reuven. You're like Shimo now. Not, I, can't, I don't even know you anymore. To you, it's, it sounds ridiculous. What do you mean? I'm still the same guy. It's just one hair different. Okay, whatever. The hair's going to grow back. Okay, he's going to... No, 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 no. And when it comes to the Sefer Torah, that's how it is. Why? This is a divine book. It's not a man-made book like Christianity and Islam and Buddhism and all of the other toivot in the world. Divine cannot have any mistakes. Divine cannot have any type of errors of any kind. In fact, divine is to such a different level that unlike your typical book in the world, where you can have a guy write a four, five, six hundred page book that in reality he could have wrote it in 20 pages. Because most of the stuff is fluff and he's trying to embellish the point and exaggerate certain things and give you more color on others and give you some, you know, all types of things. In reality, the whole point of the book, you can write in 5, 10, 20 pages. Not 400. But you know you're not going to pay 20, 30 bucks for, for a 20 page book. You know you're not going to do it. So you write, it's a 400 page book. But in reality, most of it is fluff. Most of it is nothing. Most of the books today. Complete useless. You get most of the stuff for free on the internet. And sometimes you don't even need the internet. You just know it. It's a complete waste of time. I never understood why people buy some modern books. You have books from the Rambam. 900 years ago. A person that was so smart, everyone in the world knows he's, he's, he's the smartest human being in the world. Talked about every subject you could possibly imagine. You have that available to you. You have... Torah, you have a book that Akadosh Baruch Hu wrote. Akadosh Baruch Hu wrote a book. You can read that. But you're going to go buy, go to Barnes and Nobles, buy a 1999, 2999, some novel by Stephen King just to learn how people have figured out new ways to kill each other. See, Torah Rabotai is not full of fluff. Torah is in, written in such a way that Akadosh Baruch Hu made sure that we know it's divine. How? By putting an endless amount of information that you can learn from 
from every single word. No exception. That's how Rav Wasserman begins this, this section. He says that the Torah means learning to the extent that every word has to have a lesson or else it wouldn't be there. Now the question arises then, what is the lesson that is hidden in all of the stories of the past and all of their details? Okay, I can understand the lessons in the rules. If you tell me that I have to keep Shabbat or I'm going to get a death penalty, I understand it's a very valuable lesson. I want to live. If you tell me uh, incest or homo homosexuality or bestiality is forbidden, I understand it's a very, very valuable lesson that I could learn no matter what generation I'm in. But what is the lesson that I could learn about the story of Yaakov and Esav? Okay, I understand. It's a cool story and, uh, you know, it's the mindset of a secular person. Cool story, two brothers, twins, this guy became the greatest in the world, this guy became the biggest Rasha in the world, Hashem loves him, Hashem hates him. You know, okay, it's great. But how is that relevant to me 4,000 years later? Other than enjoying the story, what could I do from here? What is this? Wasserman tells us the secret. He says, Take this as a general rule. The deeds of the fathers are a guide for the children. Meaning, the Torah narratives, all of these stories, are concentrated about all of the future episodes in the life of the Jewish people from the beginning of time until the end. In so many words, the stories is the prophecy of what will be the future of the Jewish people. The story of Yaakov and Esav is not just a story. It is your future. It was your grandparents' future, if they're no longer with us. It was what happened, and it was what will happen. These stories have the details, prophecy from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of everything that will ever be for the Jewish people. Now, he then goes on to give us the main example in this letter. He said, Parashat Vaishlach. Parashat Vaishlach. What can we learn about Parashat Vaishlach? Parashat Vaishlach is a parasha where Yaakov leaves Padan Aram, leaves Lavan Arasha after being there for over 20 years, being cheated by Lavan over a hundred times in order to marry his two daughters. And now he returns with his children. And on the way, he's going to meet Esav. That's the parasha. And the parasha begins by saying that Yaakov sent angels ahead of him to Esav, his brother, to the land of Seir, the field of Edom. And he charged them, saying, Thus shall you say, My Lord, to Esav, to my Lord Esav, so said your servant Yaakov, I have sojourned with Lavan, and I have lingered until now. So, he sends angels, mamash angels, to go see Esav and tell him, Esav, just so you know, I'm not the same Yaakov that left 20-something years ago. Not the same Yaakov. Different. Why? I went to Lavan's house, the biggest gangster in the world. You know, Lavan that you were scared of? I went to him. I was in his house. I did what I had to do. I survived and I fulfilled the entire Torah. So don't mess with me. Don't think that you could bully me around or anything. Please don't. But, here's some gifts. Here's some gifts. Here are some donkeys, some sheep, some jewels, some this, some that. I got all types of stuff as a gift to you. Like a peace offering. 
That's what the parasha begins with. Rav Wasserman says the portion of Vaishlach describes the meeting of Esav and Yaakov, which foreshadows the life of Am Yisrael among the nations. What is this telling us? This is a description of Am Yisrael's relationship with the nations of the world. When? Permanently. Especially at the era of Mashiach. According to Nechmanides, the Ramban, the one that we learned, the Igeret Ramban, from almost 900 years ago, he gives commentary on the Torah, and on this section, he says the following. In the first section of this parasha is that of the exile, which means the vision of the Jewish exile among the children of Esav. The whole exile that we've been suffering for the last couple of thousand years, all the secrets of that exile are in the first section of this parasha. Every secret you could possibly imagine, if you know how to find it, is in there. First section. And how we're going to deal with the children of Esav. Who is Esav? The parasha begins, talking about Yaakov, Vaishlach Yaakov Malachim, right? The end of the parasha, what does the end of the parasha says? The last verse of the parasha, last few words. Esav, Avi Edom. Esav is the father of Edom. So, anytime we mention Esav, it is referring to Edom. Anytime it's Edom, connected to Esav. Used to be twin brother of Yaakov. Used to have an opportunity to be Gdolado. The Midrash Me'am Lo'e says, originally, the merciful one had a plan. What was the plan? Six tribes would come from Yaakov. Six tribes would come from Esav. It was supposed to be Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Esav. That were your forefathers. But it's not. What does it say now? Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. What about Esav? Kadosh Baruch says, et Esav saneti. Esav, I hate him. Yeah, but you just said he's going to be one of the, he was supposed to be one of the tribes. How do we go from one extreme to the other? Esav knew the law, knew what was supposed to happen, but followed his desires instead. So Akadosh Baruch Hu never said he hates Paro, that killed millions and millions of Jews. Akadosh Baruch Hu never said that he hates Haman, that wanted to kill all of the Jews in the world. Akadosh Baruch Hu never said that he hated Nebuchadnezzar, that destroyed the first Bet Mikdash and killed millions and millions of people. Never say he hates them. But Esav, I hate him, he says. Why? He knew all of the truth. There was no question in his mind whether it's true or not. He knew it. He didn't want to do it. Somebody like that, I hate him. You know that you have to keep Shabbat, but you don't want to. You don't do it. Shem says, I hate you. You know you're not supposed to drive on Shabbat. But you drive anyway, I hate you. You know you're not supposed to be married to a non-Jew, if you're a Jew. No, you do it anyway, I hate you. Why? You know. Yeah, but what if it's tough for me? Oh, if it's tough for you, do you up. Work on it. Get to it. But don't just say, no, no, I'm just going to stay this way. Why? Because that's what Esau said. Esau said, not that he, it's hard for him. No, no, I'm just, it's just not for me. I'm just not going to do it. So Hashem says, oh, you're just not going to do it even though you know the truth? I hate you. There's a very big difference between someone that's sinning because he's having a difficulty overcoming a desire, and someone that just simply accepts the fact that he's just going to live as a sinner, with no care in the world. That latter one, the one that just says, I'm going to sin no matter what, just, I don't really care. Hashem says, I hate you. Why? You're like Esav. And don't tell me that your father was a big rabbi, so maybe that's going to help you, or your grandfather was a big rabbi, and no, he was going to help you. He's not going to help you. Why? Esav's father and grandfather were bigger than you. Esav's father was Yitzchak. His grandfather was Avram. And guess what? Esav is still in Genom. 4,000 years later. So now, 
the Ramban writes that the first part of this parasha talks about the Jewish exile and how the Jewish people are going to be among the children of Esav. The second section tells us about the return of Yaakov, our forefather, to Eretz Yisrael. From Padan Aram, the land of his, of his exile. Second section of the parasha talks about returning to Eretz Yisrael. So you have two sections here. One is the exile. Two is time we return to Eretz Yisrael, which is the era of Mashiach. Now the Gaomi Vilna gives commentary on this. And he says in um, he says in his uh, commentary in Eben Shlima that This portion that discusses returning to Eretz Yisrael, this is the epic of Mashiach. This is the era of Mashiach. This is what it's about. First is the exile. Second part, that's what's going to happen at the time of Mashiach. Meaning, you can find all of the deepest secrets that you want about what's going to happen at the time of Mashiach, if you know how to find them, here. This is where you can find them. Now in this portion, the Gaon Mivina says, it's written, and he put the handmaids and their children first. When Yaakov met Esau finally, and Esau shows up with 400 commanders, each having a legion of its own, some sages say it could be millions of people on his side, and Yaakov he has his wives and children. His four wives, because each wife came with a uh, shifra. So, Yaakov, in order to protect his family in a certain way, what did he do? He had the shifrot be the in front with their kids. And then Leah with her kids, <clears throat> and then Rachel with Yosef. So the Gaumi Vilna says that when we see from the Pasuk that says, and he put, meaning Yaakov put the handmaids and their children first, meaning in the front, from here we have a proof. We have a proof, the Gaumi Vilna says, that at the epoch of Mashiach, the descendants of the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude, will stand as the heads of the people. From here, from this pasuk, from this part of the so-called story, there is an enormous lesson that at the time, right before Mashiach actually arrives, the leaders of Am Yisrael are going to be Erev Rav. Now, the Arizal elaborates even further where he gets it from the Zohar Kadosh from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai from 2,500 years ago. And he says this Erev Rav is not just the political leaders like Bibi Netanyahu and his buddies and his enemies. No, no, it's not just the government, the, uh, the, <coughs> the Zionist government and them. Not, not just them. People think it's just them. No, no, that's not, that's not it. It's also the majority of the rabbis in the world. Majority of the rabbis in the world, the leaders of Keilot, of organizations, of Boca Raton Synagogue, of uh, Manus Friedman and Associate, of Emunah.com, places like that, Erev Rav. Erev Rav, 100%. More popular, more likely, that they're Erev Rav. Why? Because that's, how, that's, that's what we learn from this Pasuk. He says, this is the proof that the leaders of Am Yisrael will be the heads of the Erev Rav. And the Ramban elaborates further in his letters is that there's a promise that says in the Torah that an also in thee will they believe forever. 
which means that the Jews will cleave forever to their faith in the Torah. And if you see atheists in, his, in Israel, it's certain that their fathers did not stand at Mount Sinai, or that their origin is not from the children of Israel, but rather from the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude. So now we have to elaborate on this specific thing and clarify. The Ramban is not saying that every single person that's a Mechalel Shabbat is Erev Rav. It's not what he's saying. He's talking about specifically in this particular case, people that are the main leaders, people that are the centers of influence. If you see them and their distorted mentality being as such, for sure they're Erev Rav. What about the rest of the people that are lefty liberals, but not necessarily in a position of power? Could be Erev Rav, could be just ignorant. But if they're in a position of power, whether it be a rabbi or a political figure or an influential person of some kind, if he is an atheist, anti-God, uh, idol worshiper of some kind, bottom line is, if not a Shomer Torah and it's what Jew, Erev Rav. So it doesn't matter whether you like him and you're going to vote for him or not. No, no. If you vote for him, you're part of Erev Rav too. By supporting, you become a part. So, here he's talking about specifically the leaders. Now, my dear friend, Talmit Chacham from Costa Rica, Rav Pesach Greenberg, brought this to my attention, a very, very beautiful section in Kava Yashar. Kava Yashar is one of the great Musar books in previous generation, where simply if you read it and understand the words that are written, you get Yirat Shemaim. You don't get Yirat Shemaim, you should check your pulse, you probably already died, it's too late. And Kaba Yashal says the following in chapter 4 about what is going to be what is happening in his generation and what will happen at the time before Mashiach? Vine badarot ha'elu, ha'avon hazeh matsui ba'avonotenu ha'rabim, sh'arbe b'nei adam dorshim ba'rabim al pi akdamot shkarim u'dvarim sh'enam burim u'mesamim e'neem shel abriyot u'metakelsim u'metkelsim u'metparim mipi abriyot ומחליפים חיי העולם בשביל חיי שעה, וגורמים גזרות רעות, כנגזר לאל, כנזכר לאל. He says, in these generations, he's talking about his time and obviously the generations that follow, the era of Mashiach, in these generations, and be, due to the widespread sins, and which are our fault, many people that are public speakers, whether it be rabbis or Mr. Charlie or, or Mr. Gordy or Mr. Stevie, whatever they want to call them these days. Some people don't like to call themselves rabbi because they think it's going to get them more fans. Whatever you are. Many people that are speakers, politicians, rabbis, whoever, deliver public lectures based upon false premises, lies, and ideas that are not clear. They tell you things like, you know, God needs you, but no, He doesn't need you, He's perfect. Or they tell you things, no, there's no eternal gain, no. But then when you go and you actually have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and no one's looking, you say, wait, it does say in the Torah, there's no eternal gain, no. There, there is an eternal gain, no. No, it's not really eternal. Wait, but it says it right there. The Ramban in Shara Gmul, Gmaram Asechet Rosh and so on and so forth. It says there's, a, there's an eternal Genom. Because no, but it's not really eternal. I said, well, what do you mean? Because eventually the Neshama is going to be destroyed and there's a little piece that Hashem has in there. It's going to go eventually to Him. So that piece is not going to be destroyed after, let's say, millions of years? He goes, yeah, exactly, see? So wait. So you're telling people there's no eternal genome as if 
it's only one year, as if it's a short period of time, but in reality you know that it's millions of years and he's going to be destroyed. It's just that it's not literally eternal. It eventually ends after millions of years. So because of that, you just, you know, blankly and vaguely saying, there's no eternal gain, no. Yeah, well, it's not, that's not good. False. Falsehood. Falsehood has different shapes and sizes. It's not always clear-cut. They'll give you different ideas. Some of them are outright lies. But some of them are just simply not clear. But intentionally not clear. Leave you wondering. Leave you needing them. And he says, they blind the eyes of the public and receive their praise and, their gl and glory while exchanging the eternal world for this temporary world. In order to get just a few dollars, in order to get a few more likes on your YouTube, in order to get a few more people to order your book on Amazon, in order to get a few more places to host you and say, wow, he's one of the greatest in our generation, and get all the kavod, what do they do? They sell their soul, they sell their eternity. Why? So you can get a few extra dollars, a few extra chazaku baruchs. For a little bit of extra, they sell eternity. Moreover, they bring all of the evil decrees on the people that were mentioned above. Meaning that these false speakers are not just a danger to themselves and their eternity. In fact, they're not even just a danger to the people listening to them. They are a danger to society at large. Why? When people lie about Torah, it makes Hashem very, very angry to the extent where He punishes everybody for not going against them. So long as there is somebody rebuking the falsehood, it gives society more time to do tshuva. When people stop rebuking the falsehood, Hashem says, I'm going to destroy it. And that's what we learned from the Gemara Masechet Chayga. Where Kadosh Baruch Hu only decided to destroy the Bet HaMikdash when no one was rebuking anymore. Meaning that so long as there was one of the prophets or one of the rabbis or somebody was rebuking people and saying, listen, do tshuva, even if it didn't work, but at least he was doing it, Hashem says, I'll give him more time to do tshuva. I'll give him more time to do tshuva. The second nobody wanted to rebuke anymore, ah, it's too hard, people are not going to come back to shul anymore, let's try to do it a different way, Hashem says, ah, no rebuke, I'm going to destroy everything. Why? As the Rambam writes in al the only way to do tshuva is through rebuke. It's the only way. You can't do tshuva otherwise. There's no such thing as doing tshu real tshuva without getting rebuked. And Hashem says, you're either going to re be rebuked by the rabbi or by me. Just that with it, by Hashem, it's a lot more painful. Now, the Kaba Yashar continues and says, Whoever fears the word of Hashem will reckon the great loss and damage that he causes against the reward he receives, whether it is honor or financial, remun financial remun remuneration in this world. He says that anybody that has Yirat Shemaim, will realize how much of a loss, not a gain, they're getting by these lies and these vague points, despite the monetary advantage and the honor they get in this temporary world. All the honors he receives in this world in response to his lectures will be like a thorn or a bramble pricking at his soul. One day, a great and fearful darkness will suddenly fall upon him and no light will appear for him thereafter. Woe to him for the shame and disgrace he will experience on the day appointed for his end. The Darshanim, meaning these lecturers, will certainly not merit 
hearing the Torah insights of the lecture that the Holy One, blessed is He, will deliver in the future. As related in the Midrash, Otiyot de Rabbi Akiva, version 1, letter 7, Yakut, uh, Yeshayahu, 429. It says, eventually, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to give a big lecture. For sure, you liar, you're not going to hear it. Why? You're going to be too busy getting destroyed. For all of the neshamot you destroyed. Now what is a person to do when he has a people in his life that are not shomret Torah mitzvot? And he is not exactly a speaker, and the local speaker is not exactly a tzaddik. He's one of these people that tells people nothing. What does he do? The Kav Yashar continues in chapter 5. That it's fitting for every Jew to strive to benefit others and pray, especially on behalf of the Rishayim, of the wicked of the generation, so that they do tshuva. You don't know how to speak? At the very least, you should be praying for Am Yisrael to do tshuva. Not just Am Yisrael that's in your, under your roof. Not just your parents or your brothers and sisters or children. But Am Yisrael at large. You should be praying for them every single day. That does not mean it's enough. It means you have to do that. What else do you have to do? He says, But then, the person himself, the person that's praying, should also realize he himself has to wake up and do tshuva on his own sins. Why? Because if you don't do tshuva, for your own sins, that prayer that you prayed for your mom to do tshuva, for your brother to do tshuva, for your cousin to do tshuva, or for anybody to do tshuva, it's not going to work. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not going to do what you want if you're not doing what He wants. It doesn't work that way. So a person has to know. First person that he has to work on is himself. But also, never forget that he has to pray for Klal Yisrael. Now, The problem that we have in the world of Torah today is that unlike the secular world, where rebuking each other for mistakes is very welcome, they call it constructive criticism. If you're not a good salesman and your boss or your buddy, your colleague tells you, ah, come on, man, you got to try harder, man, come on, what are you doing? You're waking up so late, you're already late for a half hour, it's already 8.30, and he starts tearing you up at 8.30 in the morning because you're half hour late. Ah, come on, you want to be a winner, you want to be this, you can't just do this. Tears you up in the morning, you say, you know what, man, you're right, you're right, you're right, tomorrow, I'm at 7.30. You're right, man, you're right. And you make a phone call, you make a meeting, you don't close the deal. Ah, come on, man, you are this. Ah, no, hey, he starts tearing you up again. Why? Because you didn't make the deal. And you said, you're right, I'm going to try hard in there. I'm going to call, you know what, I'm going to call this guy right now. I'm going to call this guy right now. I'm going to, I'm going to close the deal. You, not only he takes the rebuke, he says, you're right, I'm going to work on it right now. I'm going to do tshuva for this mistake right now. Secular world, not only they accept rebuke, they welcome it. Say, thanks man. That constructive criticism, that changed my life. If you are uh, some, some type of speaker, some type of guru, I'll pay you $5,000, no problem. Save my life. When it comes to stuff like that, bring it on. People love criticism. Remember, I used to have employees. They come to me, he's like, listen, is there anything I can do better? Can you tell me what I'm doing wrong? I don't remember how many people I know in my life that came to me and said, Rabbi, can you tell me what I can do better? What me try I'm doing wrong? Not many. A few, Baruch Hashem, a few tzaddikim, Baruch Hashem, I had, I had the merit to meet. But not many, not many. All right. People don't like rebuke. When it comes to Torah, it comes to business, bring it on. When it comes to the stuff that doesn't matter, we like rebuke. When it comes to the stuff that matters, we don't like it. When it comes to the stuff that doesn't matter, we have no problem offering rebuke. You see your friend getting in, uh, in a fight with another friend, 
Ah, come on, guys, stop it. Let's figure it out. You don't have a problem getting involved. But you see somebody driving on Shabbat to Shul? No, no, tell him something. Tell him something. You know him, right? You sit right next to him. You, 20 years. Tell him something. No, 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 I don't want to get involved. You know, it's not my business he drives on Shabbat. It's not my business. It's not my business, Andrew. What? Right, but it was your business that these two guys were getting to fight over money? But it's not your business over here, the guy's driving on Shabbat, destroying his own Allah It's not your business. It's not your business. And that's it. That's how the Satan confuses us. Because we hear rebuke in a secular world, we welcome it, we like it, and we even consider ourselves as people that are very open to constructive criticism. But then when we hear rebuke, when it comes to our spirituality, when it comes to our neshama, when it comes to Allah, bah, no, no, I don't like this rabbi. He's extreme. He's extreme. No, I'm, very, I'm a very open person, but there's, there's something about this rabbi, I don't like, he's extreme. I'm very open. I know, listen, people, people criticize me all the time. But I don't know, this rabbi, his whole thing about Shabbat, and eh, something's wrong. Yeah, there's something's wrong. There's so much tum'ah on your head, that you cannot see straight. That's what's wrong. But sometimes, this problem began somewhere else. It began by the speakers they were listening to in their local shul, in their community, online, or even in, sometimes in books, where these speakers were what the Kavi Yashar was calling shakranin, liars. People that were seeking honor. Not people that were rebuking. And when you go and approach these rabbis and you tell them, how come you don't rebuke your people? No, come on, this generation, no one knows how to rebuke. And also, it's better I don't tell them, so, you know, they make the sins accidentally because of lack of knowledge, rather than make the sin on purpose. You know, and they'll come up with all types of excuses of why they shouldn't rebuke. All of which are complete nonsense. No one ever said that you have to be perfect in order to rebuke. You just have to be not a sinner in the thing you're rebuking about. Meaning, don't rebuke someone about not keeping Shabbat if you're not keeping Shabbat yourself. Why? Because that would make you a hypocrite and a joke. But if you're keeping Shabbat, you have full permission and obligation to rebuke about Shabbat. Don't rebuke somebody about Shlom Bayit if you're divorced 16 times. You have no right telling anyone anything about marriage. You could tell them about divorce and how expensive it is, but not marriage. You're very experienced in divorce. You're very experienced in paying for weddings too. But as far as how to maintain marriage, not so much. But if you have a long-standing, healthy relationship, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, Okay, you can give a rebuke. That's what it means. What about let them be sinners accidentally rather than sinners on purpose? It's complete nonsense. Why? The Mishnah in Avot says, Shgagat Talmud Ola Zadon. If your sin comes, accidental sin, comes as a result of not studying, in Shemaim they turn your accidental sins into purposeful sins. Why? Because your lack of studying was purposeful and therefore your sin is really on purpose because you could have studied the Torah and know what's what you're supposed to do but you chose to watch sports instead or play video games instead. So in essence, your sin is really purposeful. So what is it referring to when it says let them die, uh, you know, accidental sinners rather than purposeful sinners? This is mainly pertaining to things either because they just never got to it. They learned a lot of Torah, but they never got to this point. So it's the, the, the punishment they'll get for their accidental sins because they just simply never got to this is lower than if they did it on purpose. Or latter is if it's a rabbinical mitzvah. If it's a rabbinical mitzvah and you know that by you telling this person, rebuking this person, He's going to dafka violate this rabbinical mitzvah. It's better you don't tell him. It's better that he makes the sin accidentally without knowledge rather than you telling him he's not allowed and he does it anyway because that makes it even worse. Doesn't mean that it's better off to just stay silent. Now, what are some of the proofs? Gemara, Baba Metziah, page 31a. 
חכמים, bring the מצווה, או בוכח, תוכיח את עמיתך. The מצווה that we see in פרשת קדושים, where you obligated to rebuke your brother, or your sister, even if it's not from the same mother. You're part of Am Yisrael, you have to rebuke. So Chachamim ask, how many times do I have to rebuke? If I tell him, listen, stop driving on Shabbat, and he continues, I'm good, I, I fulfilled my obligation. If I take one of Rabbi Reuven's CDs, that he gives out for free, I give it to the guy, and he says, thank you, and throws it right in the garbage. You know, like a, like a handoff. Takes it, thank you, garbage. So I fulfilled it, I'm finished, I don't have to do nothing anymore. Fill my obligation. If I tell him, stop eating pork, and he said, no, I like it. That's it, I don't have to do it anymore. Kamala says, no. How many times you have to do it? Even a hundred times. Ocheach tochiach afilu mea peamim. Not a hundred times per se, but a hundred times or more. Meaning, to no end. So Chavim then debate, what do you mean, to no end? Some of these people, you tell them, listen, you got to stop driving on Shabbat, you got to, you know, find a Jewish spouse to marry instead of a non-Jewish spouse, you know, you got to do something. You got to stop being non-kosher, you got to stop your non-kosher business, and they'll listen to you. And you come back to them the next week, and they'll listen to you. And then you send them one of my lectures, and they watch it or don't watch it, whatever it is, but they don't change. And you keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And then eventually they get annoyed to you. And next time you tell them, listen, you shouldn't. The second you said you shouldn't, the guy gives you a nice righty, you're never going to forget his name. And you even know how his fingers feel. So what, continue? So then the Chachamim say, in Gemara Maseret Erechin, Page 16b, rebuke until he hits you. Once he hits you, then uh, you could stop. Meaning that if that, after the second time you rebuke them, he hits you, that's it. Two times is already enough. But if after a hundred times of rebuking this person, he still didn't hit you, continue. Continue. And the Rambam in Ilchot Deot, Chapter 6, Alakha number 7, says the same thing. That's why he passed against Alakha. He says, until he hits you. But the Rama in the Shulchan Aruch, in Siman 608, says that you must rebuke until he hits you or he curses you. Meaning it's already enough that he's cursing and threatening you. That's already enough. He doesn't have to actually physically hit you. Why well, he's telling him, listen, why don't you keep, and he starts, do, 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 beep, beep, you know, that stuff, all types of things, you, you, I hate you, all that stuff. Okay, once that's done, okay, finished. Next, easier customers. I promise you, most people are not going to do that. Not hitting you and not cursing you. Some will, usually if they're close to you, usually if it's family, because they feel very comfortable with you. But that's why I always tell people, the worst people in the world to do kiruv with is your own family. They're the hardest customers in the world. Do kiruv with strangers. So what's going to be with your family? Let me do it. How? Send a lecture. And I'll talk. For free. Don't do it yourself. Why? It's not going to work. It's simply not going to work. And if it does work, it's going to be after so much anguish and pain that that time and energy that you spent to actually succeed, you could have already saved a thousand people. Why? why? Why Why? exert so much? So here we see that a person has an obligation to rebuke that is not so simply no, f fulfilled. You have to do something about it. Now the Gemara in the Yerushalmi takes it a step further. It says in the Parashat HaTochecha where Kadosh Baruch Hu rebukes us threatens us if we do all types of bad things and says half of the tribes will be on one mountain the other half of the tribes will be on a different mountain one half will bring 
all the brachot. If you do such and such mitzvah, you'll get these blessings. And all of the nation, at that moment and forevermore, says, Amen. You learn Torah, you'll get such and such and such. And everybody says, Amen. And till this day, they're saying, Amen. Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Meir, everybody saying, Amen. Yeah, yeah, go, keep going. Chazak Baruch. Hashem, give him some stuff. So he can do more good. Amen. But then the other half of the mountain says the curses. Somebody that says that homosexuality is not an abomination, even though the Torah says it is. Will be cursed. Aru. Amen. Who says it? Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, David, Shlomo, Moshe Rabbeinu, everybody says, Amen. He's a what is it? Hashem cursed this person, destroyed from the world, uprooted from the world. That's what all of them are saying about this person. Why? He changed the Torah. And all types of things, sins, curses. Mitzvot, blessings. Right? So the last one, it says, Aru asher loyakim et divrei Torah azot. Cursed is the person who will not uphold these words of Torah. So the Gemara in Yerushalmi says, what does it mean uphold the Torah? The, the Torah needs to be upheld? Hashem needs our help? What does it mean to uphold the Torah? Not fulfilling the Torah, we understand. But what is it? This extra word of lo yakim. Yakim means to uphold it. Why doesn't it say, Aru Asher Lo Yekayem, or Yase, or all types of words that was it fulfilled, or, or actually uh, did these things? How come it says, uphold it? So the Gemara, the, the, the sages argue about this. It says, let me tell you what it is. Rebbe Kadosh, Ba'ala Mishnah. It says, let me tell you the secret. You know what the secret is? If there's a rabbi, who himself is a tzaddik gamur, knows the entire shas by heart, both the Yerushalmi and the Babli, knows the whole Shukhan Aruch, back and forth, knows the Zohar, knows all Sifrei Chachamim, knows every question you ask him, he'll give you an answer in a second. Tzaddik, doesn't make any sins, no pgama breed, no nothing. But he doesn't rebuke his people. Even if he's a tzaddik and everything else, but he doesn't rebuke his people, Aruhu, he's cursed. Meaning, all of his mitzvot go into the toilet. Why? His keila is destroying itself. People are violating Shabbat. They're driving. They're doing business. They're, they're talking in shul. That while there's a prayer going on, they're, they're acting at the shul like a social club rather than a place of, of worship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They, they do all types of things with their eyes that are forbidden, all types of things with their body that are forbidden. They do all types of things in business that are forbidden. They're constantly doing things against Hashem, and He knows. And He doesn't say anything. He stays quiet. Rebbe HaKadosh writes, uh, that's what it means. Aruhu. He did not uphold the Torah. Even if he himself is righteous, he's cursed. He loses everything. Now, a person that doesn't understand the obligation of rebuke from such a thing has a very, very difficult mental problem. Because the Ramban elaborates further in Parashat Ki Tavo, where the, actually the Yerushalmi specifies that he didn't publicize the Torah, he didn't defend it, he's Arur, and the Ramban writes he didn't rebuke people, and he's Arur, But then you have people that say, well, listen, hold on a second. So what do you want me to tell people that if they violate Shabbat, Hashem is going to kill them? Like, people are not going to come back. It's like, who taught like this in history? Gemara, Masechet Shabbat, page 87. Question arises. 
there's a period of almost two months that elapses between the time we left Egypt until we got to Mount Sinai. 50 days. From Pesach to Shavuot. What do we do? Okay, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking. Fine, there's gl- clouds of glory. We're not tired. We don't have to change any clothes. We have man coming from Shemaim. Shtabach Shemo. Fun, fun stuff. But what are you talking about? You know, what, Moshe Rabbeinu is a mute for, for, for two months? What's happening? The Gemara says the following. Before we got to Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu says, by the way, you know we're about to receive the Torah, right? Yeah, 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 when we get there. Yeah, yeah, it's... You didn't receive the Torah. You know what's in the Torah? No, Moshe, we didn't get it yet. I'm going to tell you what's in the Torah. If you don't keep Shabbat, I'm going to kill you. That's what's in the Torah. Why? Moshe, what do you mean? Like, spiritually you're going to kill me? You're not going to talk to us? No, 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 I'm going to kill you by much. I'll stone you to death. Take a bunch of stones. Everybody that saw you keep Shabbat, uh, Friday Shabbat, they're all going to gather some stones. Ta, 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 until you die. But that's only after we throw you from the second story to make sure you break a few bones and suffer a little bit. And if that's not enough, we're going to roll a boulder over you. He starts telling him the details of a death penalty for violating Shabbat, for violating mitzvot. People can start getting scared. But that's only the first day. It's the first shiul. Good morning. Beginning of the series. Then Moshe Rabbeinu says, oh, hold on a second, guys. That was just yesterday's shiul. Let me give you guys a better shiul today. Oh, great. Well, Moshe, what are you talking about? It's like, you know, like, like, like heaven, good stuff. No, 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 we're still, finished. We're still starting. We're at the beginning. Oh, okay. What else are we going to talk about? So listen, so after you die, don't think it's enough. Because Hashem has a place called Gehenna. In Gehenna, there's seven different levels. And you're going to go to the worst one. And you're never going to come out. You know what's there? I'm going to tell you exactly. He starts giving them all the details of Gehenna. Good morning. They haven't received the Torah yet. And he scares them to death. And after he scares them to death... The Gemara says he teaches them about the reward for their mitzvot. And some say he first taught them the reward and then he taught them the punishment. There's no question here. He taught them both. The only question is which one he started with. But the point being here, what do we learn from Moshe Rabbeinu? The rabbi of all rabbis, the prophet of all prophets, what do we learn from him? You have to tell people about punishment. You're not a better rabbi than Moshe Rabbeinu. So unless you consider yourself greater than Moshe Rabbeinu, which means you have to go to some type of psych ward, you have to teach what Moshe Rabbeinu taught. Yeah, but they're not ready. What do you mean they're not ready? Do they know about Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov? Yes. They're just as ready as the generation of knowledge before they got Torah. Before they got Torah, we didn't know the Torah. You at least have a Torah, you have a chumash in your house, you have a chumash in your computer, you have a chumash in your phone. You've read some parashot before. You probably have more knowledge about it than they did before they got Torah. So how are you less ready than them? Moshe Rabbeinu taught us the Torah without sugarcoating anything. And that's what the Gemara tells us. When it comes to rebuke Rabbutai Karim. The Chachamim were very, very zealous about it. One of the Chachamim in the previous generation was asked, how should you teach somebody about Shabbat? Should you tell him about all the reward that he would get or about all of the punishment he will get? She says, well, you should simply tell him, look, you see that guy's wife just got cancer? She died? Yes, because he didn't keep Shabbat. That's what you teach about. You see that guy, his kids died? Yeah, he didn't keep Shabbat. You want that to happen to you? And this is one of the greatest poskim in the last hundred years. Allah, that's what he writes. Writes in Allah, that's the question, that's how you answer, that's how you do it. See all the bad stuff is happening to him? Yeah, he didn't, he didn't keep Torah. That's what's happened. That's what. Why? You know what God does? I don't know exactly why, who, what, when, how, but for sure, he didn't keep Torah mitzvot, for sure bad stuff happening because of that. I don't need to know the exact sin of why Hashem punished him, but for sure he's getting punished for sins. For sure. Why? That's a law in the Torah. It's a law in the Torah. 
And it debates. Debates. Do you tell about the reward and then the punishment, or the punishment and then the reward? There's a debate between the Chachamim. Bottom line is you could do either one. You could tell them the reward, then the punishment, or the punishment, then the reward. It doesn't really make a difference. What's the order? The point is, tell them. Tell them so they know there's a danger. And that is what Rav Elchanan Wasserman tells us in the letter in the beginning. He says that before Mashiach will arrive, we will have leaders that will not tell us what the truth is. The vast majority of people do not talk about punishment. Hence the reason of why we've grown and breeded an entire society that feels like there is no such thing as responsibility. There is no such thing as punishment. If you even mention punishment in some places, they start, they're frowned upon, they, they make fun of you, oh, you're fanatic, I don't know what kind of God you have, but I don't want to believe in Him. All types of stupid things where the previous generation, a five-year-old already knew about Gehenom. Rav Avadia wrote in one of his letters, Rav Avadia, he says, we already started learning our custom, he says. Rav Avadia, Dolado, one of the greatest sages we had in history, not just in the last hundred years. He writes, it was customary in our family and still is to start teaching about punishment at six years old. Why? If you teach him at six, you won't have to teach him at 60. But if the guy doesn't know about punishment until he's 26, 30, 40 years old, after he practically ruined his life in every shape and form, it's very, very difficult to get the guy back on track. It's possible, it's done, but it's much more difficult. But you have entire yeshivot, entire school systems, entire communities that have never heard a single word about the punishments in the Torah. And these people are considered religious. They have a sukkah and sukkot. They have the lulav. They have the etrog. They have the matzah in Pesach. They even have a fire in the backyard or somewhere in the field. For Lak Baomil. And they love Hanukkah and they light the lights. And they eat the sufganiyot. And they fast on Yom Kippur. And they eat all types of wonderful food on Rosh Hashanah. And they go to shul three times a day. But punishment... Zero. Zero knowledge, even though the Torah spends more time talking about punishment than anything else. Rav Wasserman says that's because the leaders of the last generation will withhold that information from them for their own self-interest. And then he continues, as we see nowadays, he's talking about 85 years ago. Nowadays, these unbelievers are leading the people. We can know how right... The Gaon Mi Vilna was. He's already talking about 85 years ago, the falsehood. Things obviously have deteriorated since then. He sees already we're seeing everything the Gaon Mi Vilna says come true in his day. Needless to say today. He says, these are the children of the Erev Rav. And Leah and our children, the Pasuk says, after. This represents the masses of the house of Israel. Who will be subject, subjugated to the Erev Rav says the rest of Am Yisrael, not the leaders, the rest of the people, the ignorant, the people that are keeping Torah and Mitzvot, the people that don't even know the difference between Torah and Mitzvot and uh, their local uh, government law. They're just ignorant. They're going to be, unfortunately, the victims of the Erev Rav. And he says, just like we are in a so Soviet Russia or another country. He doesn't specify what country it is. Could be referring to the United States. Could be referring to Germany, could be referring to the UK, wherever he's referring to. Point is, he says that just like people are under control from these other governments, Am Yisrael is under the control of the Erev Rav. And then the uh, last part of the Pasuk of this section says that, and Rachel and Yosef, all the way in the back. Who is Rachel and Yosef representing? These are the Torah students which are the lowest of all. To this appearance also we are eyewitnesses. There is no land in which the escaped remnant of the Torah students is not derided and shamed. He says in the generation of Mashiach, the people that are observing the Torah, upholding the Torah, are fulfilling the Torah, 
are going to be shamed and derided the most. Made fun of. Gone against. All types of things. You know, normal news networks usually have different people in charge of certain things. So for example, when I was on Wall Street, the main channel that we watch is CNBC and sometimes Bloomberg. Now, you pretty much see the same five or six, seven people all day, newscasters all day. This guy talks about stocks. This guy talks about options. This guy talks about bonds, insurance, auto market, different things. But the guy's focus is on something. That's his focus, meaning you're paying this guy a handsome salary or this woman a handsome salary to focus all of their energy on a specific expertise, auto market or the options market or stock market, whatever it is. In the generation of Mashiach that we're in right now, the news network in Eretz Yisrael has not one, has teams of people, teams of journalists focused solely on finding ways to embarrass and shame the religious people. Hashem Yishmor V'yatzil. What are they looking for? They're looking for that one filthy, disgusting pedophile that looks religious because he has peyot and he has a keep on, so they think he's religious. And they're going to highlight it all over the news. They're looking for the one guy that cheated somebody in business or the one guy that didn't, sta you know, didn't uh, stand during the, uh, the, uh, when they have the mourning for the, uh, for the dead. All types of things. Whatever they can. They got cameraman. They got this. Highlight in the news over and over and over again. Every day, every day. New, more garbage, more garbage, more garbage. But specified on religious people. You're talking about millions of dollars spent just to shame the Torah. Why? Because the Erev Rav has to constantly fight the Torah. To get more customers, to pacify their conscience if it even exists. It's furthermore written in this parasha, parashat Vayishlach with, uh, with Yaakov Avinu, in uh, chapter 32, verse 25 of Genesis, and a man wrestled with him, meaning that before Yaakov, before Yaakov crossed the river, says there was a man that fought, fought with him, and Chazal says it was an angel. Who is this? Yaakov represents the pillar of Torah, and the man is referring to the Satan himself. That's the angel of Edom. A dome. Every, every nation has an angel. Yaakov, he represents Am Yisrael. He represents Am Yisrael. A dome, a sav, that represents the goyim. Who's their angel? Satan himself. Not all of the goyim. There's the Ishmaelim, there's the Edomites, and so on. But for a dome, their angel is Satan himself. This indicates that in the era of Mashiach, Immorality will struggle with the study of Torah. We learn from here, he says, that at the time of Mashiach, even the Bnei Torah, the people that are learning Torah, they're going to still fight with the Satan himself. What fight? Immorality. What's immorality? Wasting seed. Pagama Brit. Not watching their eyes with those it's pornography. All of these sex crimes. That's what's going to be the struggle of the generation before Mashiach. Now the Kabbalah Yashar, in chapter 58, says, Tzarich Adam zera levatala. says, if a man has been guilty of wasting seed, he must do tshuva without delay and remedy the blemish he has imparted on the Brit Milah, on the covenant of circumcision. What are some of the benefits of doing this other than the fact that you won't go to Gainom if you do tshuva? He says that even if he transgressed numerous times, 
He should know that the Holy One, blessed is He, is a merciful King who accepts tshuva of those who return to Him wholeheartedly. As it is written, but he who confesses and desists from sinning will receive mercy. In Proverbs 28, 13. But there's also a huge benefit in this world that the person will get. And what is it? He will be granted an increase in Yirat Shamaim and Kedusha. That by doing tshuva, just for wasting seed, not for everything else yet, just stop wasting seed by itself improves the person's Yirat Shamaim, is all of Hashem, and his holiness. Automatically. Now it's not after, oh no, I, I know I've been holding it already for two weeks, Rabbi. Nothing changed. Yeah, two weeks is not really Chuba yet, buddy. Talk to me after six months, a year. Yeah, 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 we'll talk. A month is not enough. It takes a while. You have to withhold this test. You have to overcome. Different people, different time frames. But the point being is that when a person does tshuva for this specific issue, he makes himself kadosh. Kadosh. His yirat shamayim automatically turned back on. So what does that also tell us? If you see people making fun of yirat shamayim, making fun of fear of Hashem, making fun of Musar, also tells you something else. For sure, without a doubt, a shadow of a doubt, they waste seed. For sure. Why? If you, if you didn't waste seed, you'd have Yirat Shemayim. Since you have no Yirat Shemayim, for sure you waste seed. Simple, simple logic. You don't have to be a genius. You have to be Rav Vadya or Moshe Rabbeinu. Simple. Because that's one of the simple gifts that you get, you get many, many other gifts. Parnasat tova, if you protect your breed. Zivug, good kids, holy kids. A million and a half different presents you get in this world and the next. You also get a million and a half different punishments in this world and the next if you don't watch your breed. But the point being is that when somebody makes fun of Yirat Shemaim and this type of teaching that tells people they have to be scared of sinning, it simply means that they are sinners themselves of this specific sin. You don't have to ask them. You don't have to ask them, oh, do you waste seed? You don't have to. Simply, you know they do. And Rav Wasserman says that this is going to be the tikkun of the generation, not just for the secular people who do not even know why they're alive and what's the difference between them and cows. He's talking about with the people in the fun world. As indicated by this pasuk, and the man wrestled with him. Yaakov, the pillar of Torah, wrestling with the Satan himself. And then the pursuit continued, and the thigh of Yaakov shrank. This is referring to the Torah school children who formed the backbone of the people during the thousands of years. Even this foundation will weaken at the era of Mashiach through the attacks of the internal and external enemies. This too has come true in our days wherever Israel has been scattered most of the children behave like absolute goyim. He says the school system has failed so much that most Jewish kids you cannot tell that they're Jewish. This is a bigger tragedy than everything I just said for the last hour and a half. Why? That's our future. Because we have to move again. Baruch Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu, make sure that we enjoy the exile. So we move almost every year. Not because we don't pay, but because we pay. People get so excited about taking advantage of us that they violate the deals. But it's all from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Shtabach Shimon. But part of my move was, you know, we had to see a few houses. And one of the houses, I met a uh, person that came here from Eretz Yisrael five years ago. And now he's looking to either sell or rent his house. And uh, I said, why would, were you, the house was still occupied. So when are you moving? Oh, we're moving in a month, we're going back to Eretz Yisrael. So, oh, okay, Mazal Tov. He goes, yeah, yeah, I can't stand it here, it's ruining my kids. 
So what do you do? Why, why is it ruining your kids? He says, I'm a teacher in the yeshiva, in Jewish school. Teacher in yeshiva should be, you know, if your kids are ruined, uh, how is the rest of them going to survive? He says, listen, people pay twenty to $30,000 a year for their kids to come to our school, Jewish school, and all they're getting is 30 minutes of Torah. The rest of it is secular studies and nonsense. $30,000 a year to get a half hour of Torah. For $30,000 a year, Rabotai, you can get a private tutor to come to your house, teach your kid all day. Maybe a little bit more. But what? They sell them to a public school that has a class called Torah. No wonder the kids don't know Aleph Bet even by the time they graduate. No wonder they can't even spell a single Hebrew word without looking at their phone to, ch to spell check. No wonder you tell them anything about Parashat Shavuot. They're like, wait, wh which book are we on? What are you reading again? They graduate, they go to these schools and they graduate completely ignorant, but worse than if they actually went to public school. Why? Because at least the public school kid wasn't confused with the Jewish aspect. He just, secular studies. The one that goes to a so-called Jewish school, or yeshiva they want to call it, but only gets a half hour of Jewish studies or an hour of Jewish studies and 90% of the day is secular studies, he's going to be much more confused than everybody else. Why? Because automatically, just the fact that he's at a place where 90% of the day is secular studies, automatically in his mind, he's doing the calculation subconsciously that secular studies are much more important than Torah. So this whole... Jewish school thing, it's just a facade to make money. There's no other reason. And the guy says, I see how my kids have been here for the last five years, and I can tell you, they're not allowed to have any friends. Why? All of their friends from that same school are secular. Nobody keeps anything. Nobody keeps a single thing. And I can't let my kids go to their houses. I don't even know if they have kosher food. They go to school with a uniform. As soon as the school's over, they look like going, take off all the clothes. I can't have my kids hanging out with them. They'll go back to Israel. Done. Unfortunately, that's not the only school. There's many others just like it. All over the world. Including Israel. Including Israel. In Israel, they have places, secular schools, that have a Tanakh class. But they teach it as a subject, like as if it's another opinion. Taught by an Arab, taught by a Christian. Tanakh class, taught by an Arab or a Christian. So the kid says, wait, so the science teacher told me that we came from a monkey. You're telling me that we came from some god. Which one is it? Ah, uh, you know Musa, oh Moshe, uh, you know, because uh, that's how Arabs called Moshe, they called Musa. You know, he, peace be upon him, he's good, but you can believe whatever you want, because even the Arab teacher is secular. Because a, a religious Arab will never work in a secular school. Well, you can believe whatever you want. Maybe monkey, maybe this, maybe that, you know, open mind. Open also says, Genom opens, opens, opens. It's big, big, big. No end. But that's what's happening, Rabotai. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu cries every single day over his children. As he says in the Pasuk in Psalms, he says to Am Yisrael, he says to his children, Al tigu b'meshichai ulneviai al tareu he says, dare not touch my anointed ones, my, Mashiach, my, my Mashiachs, and to my prophets do not harm. So we all know that the Mashiach is a prophet. So why does this pasuk that David Melech wrote in Psalm 105 verse 15, why does it say, don't touch my Mashiachs, as if there's more than one Mashiach, and also don't touch my prophets? Because he's not talking about the Mashiach, and he's not talking about the prophets. Who is he talking about? The Tinokot Shed Bet Rabban. He's talking about the children of Am Yisrael. 
that every single one of them has an ability, an opportunity, a potential to be a Mashiach, to be a prophet. Don't hurt him. He's special. You may not like him. You may not care about him. But Hashem says, he's my boy. She's my little girl. She's my baby. He's my baby. Don't hurt him. How are you hurting them? By sending them to what Arab Shach called the spiritual gas chambers. When a parent sends their child to a public school or to a yeshiva, Jewish school, slash Hebrew school, whatever you want to call it, that's insufficient, where the vast majority of what they're learning is secular studies, that Rabotai is spiritual gas chamber. Why? The kid is going to leave that school with no concept of what the emet is. If he goes to a school with only a, an hour a day, he's learning Torah, Seven hours a day he's learning how gymnastics and create, uh, creative writing and every other subject under the sun, including history and science that contradict what the Torah says. Guess what? He's going to graduate at 17 years old, an atheist. An atheist. No more, no less. How do I know? I've seen it with my own eyes. Hundreds and hundreds of boys. If the main foundation of what your child is learning, if the main foundation is Torah, you're protecting him. If it's not, you're destroying him. You're destroying him. You are simply taking your own boy, your own little girl, that you toiled and toiled to bring into this world, and you yourself are putting them into a spiritual gas chamber. Nothing less. You're murdering your own kid. Why? Your kid is not going to have a clue of why he's in this world and how does he go to the eternal world of good at the time he graduates school. He's not going to know. How do I know? I deal with them all day, every day. Hundreds and hundreds of boys. Hundreds and hundreds of girls every single day graduated these so-called Hebrew schools completely confused, completely atheistic, completely just demented as far as their mentality. And they're finally starting to do tshuva. Why? They saw shul, they realized, ooh, I didn't learn this in yeshiva, and I didn't learn that in yeshiva, and I didn't learn this in yeshiva, and I didn't learn... Uh, and I realized, I've been watching you for six months, I've learned more in six months than in 16 years. How is this possible? How come they didn't teach me about Moshe Rabbeinu? Like you're teaching about Moshe Rabbeinu. I heard about it every year, but never heard this. How come? The reality of is that when a kid goes to a school that's a public school or a school of other types of heresy, you're simply killing the kid. And the Midrash Me'am Loez writes in Parashat Yitro, parents that send their kids to such schools are considered idol worshippers. Now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu cries for his kids every day. But as I told you before, Kadosh Baruch Hu also brings down the pain in this world. So what happens to those kids? They eventually grow up. They grow up. And instead of calling Ima, Ima, and Abba, Abba, what do they do? Steve, I need a car. You're looking, who's Steve? Oh, that's my dad. Wait, you call your father by his first name? And you yell at him to give you the car? Yeah, what's the problem? What? Sarah, Sarah, you made me food. Wait, you have a, you have a, you have a clean lady? Who's that? Who, who are you talking to? Oh, uh, my mom. What? What do you want? You want a sandwich too? Sarah, he wants a sandwich also. Like, he treats his parents like it's a restaurant. Why? Because parents send him to a school that might as well be a restaurant. It's their fault. It's not his fault. That's what he learned. That's what he learned. That's what, that's what he learned. Now guess what? Same thing applies for Goim. Why do you think there are hundreds of thousands of Goim, and Jews, unfortunately, not as many Jews, Baruch Hashem, but countless, countless people just decided to destroy society in America. Just destroy stores, destroy uh, markets, destroy people's houses, destroy banks, destroy cars, destroy everything in their sight. Why? 
Where do you think they got their education from? The zoo you call public school. What do they teach them in public school? You came from a amoeba. You eventually arrived to become a monkey. And then eventually you became a human. And how did you do all of this? Survival of the fittest. So when the society is attacking me, what do I got to do? Survive. How? I got to be the fittest. I got to be the strongest. I got to destroy society. Why? For my own survival. That's what public school teaches. Why is anybody surprised that they're destroying everything in sight? This is what you taught them in school. When you have a human being, forget just a Jew, a human being without Torah, without guidance from the divine that's absolutely perfect, that person is for sure going to act like an animal or worse. No disrespect to the animals. Because the animals are acting like animals. You can't blame them for that. But when a human being just decides to destroy stuff, you have to figure out where does this come from? Where does this aggression come from? Oh, what did he do every day? Let's see. What is the average day for a regular kid today? Whether he goes to public school or he goes to these half yeshiva type of places where it's like a one hour, half hour, sometimes hour and a half Jewish studies. Zero Yerat Shemaim, but lots of nonsense. What is this day like? Wakes up in the morning, goes to school to, you know, they want to make sure that you feel like it's really serious so they make you wake up really early. You get to school at 7 o'clock in the morning like you're some farmer. You're half asleep till 12 because, you know, you went to sleep at 3. By the time you wake up, it's gym class, so you have a good time over there. Finally, you finish school. What do you do after school? Oh, option number one, most popular. Go home or to your friend's house and play video games. What kind of video games? Of course, the most violent ones. Ones where I could just murder people on a screen for hours upon hours upon hours and just different video games that murder other people but just in different ways and different graphics and different details and different features to give me more of a realistic feel of how it feels like to murder people and do this for hours and if it's not enough they give you the ability to talk to the people you're murdering in somewhere in the world on some headphones while you're playing in a joint ah, I got you I shot you in the face that's what the kid does for hours murdering people hence the reason why there's an average of one shooting every single week in America in schools meaning you send your kid to school 50% chance he's not coming back but not because he, he like ran away when he goes to get a shot. That's what they do. Now, if that's not enough, you know, let's say your kid is not into the video games all day, just sometimes. What does he do? Okay, uh, I'm going to go hang out with my friends. What are you guys going to do? You know, what? a little thing. What? What is that? What? Talk to me in like, English. Oh, we're going to smoke a little. What do you mean? You're 13 years old. What are, you, what are you smoking? What do you mean? I'm going to have a good time. Smoke a little hashish. Smoke a little pot, smoke a little this, a little that. You know, I tried a few other things, a little shroom, a little this. Little. By the time he's 14, he's a pharmacist. He knows every drug under the sun. And he knows how it affects people. And he knows a few people that probably died. Or at least went to the hospital and had to pump their stomach. And he knows this better than he knows his schoolwork. Now, if that's not enough, you got another pleasure in life. What? Hey, Dad, that's my girlfriend. What? Girlfriend? Yeah, 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 it's my girl. Don't look at her. It's mine. Oh, okay, yeah, kid. All right, all right. Well, it's home. It's 9 o'clock at night, son. Where's she? No, she's sleeping over, Dad. What? Sleeping over? Why can't you sleep home? No, Dad, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah? Sleeping over. Mom, my boyfriend's sleeping over. My boyfriend, sleeping over. My 15 year old boyfriend's sleeping over. This is normal. Yeah, honey, as long as you're home, it's okay that your boyfriend sleeps over. Ah, oh, honey, as long as you're home, then it's okay that your girlfriend sleeps over. All the best yet. 
This is the best one. Dad, Mom, listen, Steve, Wilma, whatever your names are. Listen, guys, I need the car. I'm going clubbing with my, my friends. What? Where are you going? Clubbing. What, what is that clubbing? What is that? What is that? Like a, like a, like a community dance? No, no, no. You know, we're not 100 years old. Abba. Listen, we're going to the club. We're going to the sound factory. We're going to the tunnel. We're going to some club. We're going to have a good time. Oh, when are you going to come home? I'll come home. I'll see you. So the father and the mother are scared to death. Why? It's 2 o'clock in the morning and the kid hasn't come home. Now he hasn't come home. Now, they don't know what to do with themselves. But then one day, they get the wonderful phone call. 2.30 in the morning. Phone rings. Never good news. And they hear a bunch of people laughing in the background. Ha ha ha. They think, oh, maybe the kid called to say hello or something. That's why he's late. Oh, listen, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Smith? Yes. Yeah, your daughter, uh, she, uh, she's throwing up in the bathroom. You want to come pick her up? <laughs> it's really funny, but you probably want to pick her up. Our, you're like our dad, right? Mr. Smith? Your daughter, why is she throwing up? Oh, you know, she got high and she got drunk and yeah, a few things. I don't know, we're not sure really. But you going to pick her up or should we just call the uh, ambulance? And a man that worked all day and all night to pay for twenty, thirty thousand dollars tuition for half hour of Torah studies or for public school just to save some money. What does he do? He gets up with his pajamas at two thirty in the morning to go pick up his drunk daughter that's thirteen years old that's vomiting her life out, and then by the time he gets to see her. He sees that she doesn't look like the girl that left his house. It looks like something happened beyond the drunk. It looks like something intentional happened. And this Rabotai, every single day. Every day. Akadosh Baruch Hu says, If you learn my Torah, and you obey it, and you fulfill it, none of this is relevant to you. But if you don't, you don't have to worry about Gehenom. You'll live Gehenom in this world. When your daughter and your son and your nephew and your friend and your neighbor and your important people, they're going to get you that, those phone calls. And once in a while it's going to be throwing up in the middle of the night. Once in a while it's going to be a 14-year-old that's pregnant. Once in a while it's going to be a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old or a 12-year-old that got molested. Or once in a while it's going to be someone that just overdoses and dies. And, Ribbono Shalom, have mercy on me. I already am, I don't know how many people I already know that already died. And I haven't re even reached half my life. The older you get, the more people you know that die. There's at least 30, 35 people from my graduating class that I know died. And it's not from natural causes. This is every day. Kadosh Baruch Hu says, a life without Torah is not a life. It's Gehenna. It's the worst. You're never going to win in anything. Your life is simply going to be miserable and awful. And all you're going to do is like, oh, it's bad luck. Oh, yeah, it's bad friends. Oh, yeah. No, no, it's you. You invested in poison by sending your children to a school that teaches things that are anti-Torah. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave a promise of what's going to happen to those people. And that's just a down payment. We're not even talking about what happens after this life. And every single day, I deal with different young boys and girls and older boys and girls and already men and women that are either in addiction, recovering from addiction, have been molested, are suicidal, all types of awful things. You know, sometimes people tell me, at least once a week, I have the blessing of somebody telling me, listen, I want to be a speaker like you. And I laugh in my heart of how naive these people are. Like, they think that this is all we do. Like, the speech, this is it. Yeah, maybe if you're Madison Company, that's what you do. But when you're actually there to help society, Rabutai, this, what you see here, is the easiest part of the job. The hard part it's 3, 4 o'clock in the morning talking to somebody and trying to convince them not to commit suicide. Or at 6 p.m. talking to a woman that her husband just abducted their child and, and fled the country. 
or a day before, sending some money to a 12-year-old girl. Why? Because her and her sister were molested by the same guy. The amount of tragedies that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is simply something you cannot even imagine. When I tell you these stories, I'm not saying it as a joke, even though sometimes it sounds funny. I'm not saying it as an example, as if it's not real. Everything I tell you is happening, has happened, and will continue to happen. All of it. I just don't mention names for the sake of the honor of these people, these poor people. I had a little girl, a little girl, 12-year-old girl, crying to her husband in Eretz Yisrael. Why? They can't afford to have a bat mitzvah. Okay, a lot of people can't afford to have a bat mitzvah. Why would your own Reuven and Be'ezrat Hashem send $7,000 to help this little girl have a bat mitzvah? We have plenty of other things that we can do in life. Spend those $7,000 on, I don't know, more CDs, help more neshamot. More food for poor people. More books, more videos. Why should we stop our life and care about this kid? You know why? Because she was one of the victims of society that has teachers like Manus Friedman and Drol Kasuto. Her and her sister were molested. And both of them got to such a horrible point, life lost its meaning. The father went to a mental institution. And this older sister is still trying to recover from just the trauma that happened to her two little sisters. So what do you think? Oh, let's wait to do a campaign. Maybe they're going to send us the, the money. No. You just do good. Why? You have to save people. And this is what you have to deal with. Why? Because society sucks. And I'm talking about both the religious and the non-religious. It's horrible. Because we failed miserably. I went to public school. I know what they teach there. Nothing good comes out of public school. Nothing. If people do not understand the value of building a kosher yeshiva, if people do not know the value of having a kosher teaching institution, if people do not know the value of having a kosher Torah, and they're not going to start investing in it, then a Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to say, don't worry. You don't know what the value is? I'll show you. I'll show you the outcome of not having it. Hence the society you have today, where you have hundreds of thousands of people feeling perfectly fine destroying society without thinking twice. I gave a shiur one time to a bunch of so-called religious kids. At the end of the shiur, one of the kids show, co comes up to me, he says, listen, and there's a bunch of other kids there, and one of you, Sonny, was with me. The kid comes up to me, he says, wait, listen, Rabbi, so what do you tell me? Like, according to you? I said, no, no, hold on, rephrase the question. Nothing's according to me. Torah. All right, okay, according to the Torah, like, I'm not allowed to sell drugs? Religious kid, pay out. Not to sell drugs? What do I? What, why? Why not? So because you're hurting people? Because what's my? I don't care. What well, is that my business? I'm just making money. It's their problem. They're buying. I'm just providing them a product. Business is business, no rabbi? No. No business is not business. You're hurting people. It's not business. It's murder. Religious kid. Or at least looks religious. In a non-religious world, you know how many people I know that used to sell drugs? You know how many people I know that actually got killed because they sell drugs? Kids would sit next to you on the bus just all the way to school, every day. Every day on the way to school. This guy sells, that guy sells, this guy sells. They always walk around with brand new clothes. How do you have so much money? I don't know. On the teams, all types of stuff. Tons, tons. Why? That's what they teach. Survival of the fittest mentality. When you do not have a kosher Torah institution with kosher teachers and things that hold up the Torah and fight for the Torah day and night, 
All you're going to have is the exact opposite, Sodom and Gomorrah. There is no middle ground. People think, no, no, it doesn't necessarily need to be this extreme. It doesn't have to be that bad. No, no, no. It does. That's the rule of the world. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu says. If it's not, Moshe Rabbeinu, it's Korach Ve'adato. It's the enemy. And that's what's going to happen. Rav Wasserman says, before Mashiach comes, the children will behave like complete Gentiles. There's another interpretation of what the Thay of Yaakov could mean. That those who support the Torah, who support Torah students, and make it possible for them to study in a peaceful conditions, they will be considered the Thay of Yaakov. And since Israel became a nation, much importance has been attached to this precept of Yisachar and Zvulun, where you take a piece of your income and you invest it in Torah. You take your ma'asel, 10% of your salary, and you invest it into kosher Torah, to publicize Torah, kiruv. You make sure that you invest your money wisely. The Gaomi Vilna says, ma'asel v'titasher, that when a person gives ma'asel, HaKadosh Baruch Hu offers him protection. That he's not going to lose his money. But if he wants to get rich during his lifetime, he has to give chomish, 20%. 20% of his salary. Oh, it's a lot. Okay, so don't give. Give, don't give. Hashem runs the world. But point is, that's what it is. So a bunch of, a bunch of rich people showed up after the crisis that happened in the worldwide market. Lots of people lost a lot of money. A group of about 30 millionaires showed up to Rav Steinemann, Rav Shalom, complaining, Rabbi, what's going on? What happened? Whole depression happening in the world. We all lost a lot of money. We gave tzedakah. Rav Steinemann giggles and he says, can anyone here swear that they gave real ma'asel 100%, they gave 10% with no exception. They counted to the dot. One person raised his hand. 29, they didn't do nothing. He said, you gave myself? He said, Rabbi, I gave myself to the T and I didn't want to say it because I felt bad for my friends that lost so much money, but I didn't lose a penny. And Rav Steinemann says, you see? That's the Torah. Torah says you give ma'asel, you're not going to lose. You're not going to lose. So that means you guys didn't give the ma'asel. You gave staka. You could have given millions, but you didn't give at least ma'asel. There's no protection for your money. No protection. When a person invests their money into Torah, they have protection. Rav Wasserman continues, we're almost done with this section of the letter, and he says that the era of Mashiach this precept of supporting the Torah is annulled everywhere. Meaning, it's simply not done. People are not investing in Torah. Yeah, you have your occasional person that donates a few thousand dollars or maybe more, but the average person doesn't do it. Even in those countries where it's still temporarily possible to help financially, people give to all types of causes but when it comes to Torah, putas are left, pennies. They'll donate $25,000 to some Save the Dog Foundation. He'll donate $100,000 to some zoo. He'll donate $500,000 to some hospital. But when it comes to upholding the Torah world, to helping some Avrahim real live a respectable life, to helping Am Yisrael do tshuva, yeah, I'll give you $180. Listen, if that's all you have, $180, Chazaku Baruch, that's worth millions. But if you donated 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 200,000 dollars to save some dog or to have some party, and all you're giving is $180 for Torah, for Klali Sadu Tshuva, you'll get punished for it, not rewarded. Why? Look what you did to, with the gift that Hashem gave you. 
Even the better classes, the wealthy people, at most are indifferent towards Torah. And it's no wonder, as a measure for measure, that the younger generation are completely ignorant of the Torah. They cannot appreciate the value of its study. From here we see that it's two things that are interdependent. The cessation of the children's Torah education and, a, and Torah support. He simply tells us this is a measure for measure. The kids today are ignorant of Torah because of two major reasons. One, the educational system is horrible. Of course, there are some good schools. They exist, but it's not the standard or even close to it. They're the diamonds in the rough. There's a few that are diamonds here and there. They exist in the world. But what are you going to put? Millions of kids in one school? You can't. And then we arrive at the second problem. There's no investments in the Torah. So what does that mean? Many times these good schools don't have any money to grow, don't have any money to continue. So somebody asked me the other day, do you, do you know of any good school in Givat Shul in Israel? I said, I'll ask Rabbi Ephraim. He says, so a really good school means a seriously religious school. He said, yeah, there's a fantastic one over there. He says the condition, spiritually, is amazing. Financially, horrific. Horrific. Like the place looks like a, a dungeon. Why? Can't afford. Can't afford. We started a yeshiva campaign. Everybody got excited. They sent me emails. Yeah, yeah, go yeshiva, go yeshiva. All right, it's been a month. We raised $5,000. Can't even pay for the bat mitzvah that we sent this morning. Okay, now, what are you going to do? Even the $500,000 wasn't enough. It was just to, to rent the place and pay some teachers. But what happens? The problem is that the people that love us, they donate as much as they can. Because they believe in it and they do whatever they can. And they're amazing people. What's the problem? Most of them don't have that much money. The people that have a lot of money, eh, not so much. They'll donate to Droll and Manus and Company and Goldberg and Company and all of these. And love. Why? You have to have merit to do real Kiruv. You have to have merit to be a partner in Kiruv. Hashem is not going to just let anyone be a partner in this holy place. Hashem is not going to just let anyone save Neshamot. Reality is it's difficult. And the Kadosh Baruch Hu makes it difficult specifically because not everybody has the merit. Plus, the Kadosh Baruch Hu wants to share the mitzvah and he want, maybe he wants to collect it $1,000 at a time, $100 at a time, $5 at a time, who knows? But the point is, part of the reason is because people do not know the value of kosher Torah until it's too late where you see on the news disaster after disaster and it's not because of Russia versus America or some virus from China or any of that nonsense. It has nothing to do with it. Even if everything was good pre-coronavirus, life was horrible. Every day you get phone calls, my kid overdosed, my kid's about to overdose, we're getting a divorce, we're getting married but we're not really sure. Nobody knows what they're doing, this guy's sick. I know at least a half a dozen people that have stage 4 cancer. I mean, the amount of tragedies that you hear about every single day, you say to yourself, I don't need more strength to learn Torah, I need more strength just to survive the day from all the awful news and the guidance you got to give people to just keep going. But where does the main money go to, main investment go to? The places that satisfies people's pleasures and desires. People that tell them everything's good. You're a tzaddik. You're going to heaven. Why? Because you donate a million dollars to some secular school, you're going to heaven. And this is the saddest part of all. Wasserman says, what is God's reply to this lack of investment in education system, in the Torah? As it says in Parashat Vayikra, chapter 26, verse 25, for the sin of suppression of Torah, the sword and plunder will come, as it is written, 
and I shall bring upon you the sword avenging the covenant. The covenant means the Torah, of which it's written, if not for my covenant by day and night, then I have not set up the statues of the heaven and earth. He says they're measure for measure for not upholding the Torah is a Kadosh Baruch who brings war to the world. Destruction, holocaust, nightmare. Why? It says either you do tshuva from learning Torah or force you to do it. Because you didn't do it. And you'll see how you're, because you're destroying the world. It's not that Hashem wants to destroy the world. We've already destroyed it. Your average kid has gotten high a hundred times by the time he's 15. There are more people getting divorced than getting married. Western society has a divorce rate of over 80%. You're more likely to win the lotto than stay married past 10 years. 94% of Jews in America violate Shabbat. Your average non-Jewish kid today thinks he could just simply do whatever he wants and he's either going to go to heaven or he's going to become dust. And your average Jewish kid is not much different. People think that you can just do whatever you want. Act however you want. And it's all based on luck, bad luck, good luck, karma, dharma, all types of nonsense. Everything except the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Everything except the Kadosh Baruch Hu. So Kadosh Baruch Hu says, it's not that I want to destroy the world. You've destroyed it. I'm simply trying to preserve what I have left. You see, when a tragedy happens and you lose a lot, the first thing you need to do before deciding of fighting back or anything else, the first thing you need to do is take protective measures of what you have left. Why? Because if you f use all of the energy and resources that you have left to m make a mistake, then guess what? Your existing loss is nothing in comparison to the loss that's about to come. You won't have anything left. But at the very least, if you take protective measures to protect what you have left, even though it's less than what you had, but it's at least something, you're assured that, okay, at least I'll have something. Even if I attack back or I don't attack back, I'll have something left. This is not just a rule for war. It's in life. It's in society. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is simply telling us that before Mashiach comes, you are going to be in the world where people are going to go against Hashem in every way, shape, or form. And Hashem is going to give every single person an opportunity to do tshuva. More than one, more than twice, more than five times, more than ten. Everybody's going to get an opportunity to do tshuva. Everyone. And anyone that tries 100% to do tshuva, Hashem says, you'll find me. You look for me with all of your heart, you'll find me. But those that don't find Him, He says, you won't find me. And you'll be destroyed with the rest. Why? It's not that Hashem wants to destroy them. They've already destroyed themselves. They lived a life that's so awful it's not a life. It's not a life worth living. There are so many people that are suicidal because they don't have a life that's worth living. That's the truth. There's no purpose to their life. Every other day I talk to somebody else that's suicidal. Why? Because the current life that they have is not a life worth living. There's not a tenti. There's no Hashem. A life with no Hashem is not a life. A world with no Hashem is not a world. So before Kadosh Baruch Hu closes the last chapter, the store, he's going to give everybody a chance. But he's going to speed up the process. All of the bad will be vomited out. And you're going to see it everywhere. The stuff that you're seeing right now in the streets, it's not the end. It's going to get worse. Not just here.
Everywhere. People think, oh, we do Aliyah. What do you think? It's Gan Eden over there. There's bad stuff everywhere. So what do you do? The only way to succeed at the end of days is to increase the Kedusha in the world. First start with yourself, then work on Am Yisrael. Work on society. Invest more into Torah. Your own learning and other people's learning. That's the only defense. And Rav Wasserman's last sentence in this letter is, In Vienna alone, Jewish possessions to the value of $40 million were plundered. Woe to mankind for the insults to the law. Why does Rav Wasserman mention a dollar figure? What is he, the news? No. Rav Wasserman says, look, you didn't invest in Torah? Just in Vienna, they took $40 million, which in today's terms, it's like $4 billion. You didn't invest this $40 million, you could have invested into building the entire Jewish community in five countries. But instead, you left it with paintings. You left it with little pieces of gold. You left it with diamonds. You left it with chandeliers. You left it with all types of property. And just like that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, now it's not yours. The Goyim took it from you, and then on top of that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, woe to mankind for the insults of Torah. You get punished on top of that. It's not just a loss. Why? I gave you $40 million and you used it for chandeliers when my children couldn't afford money to eat, when my children couldn't afford a Sefer Torah to read when my children couldn't have a kosher school? You spent money on chandeliers and houses? You get punished. And many times people think, no, no, I'm working really hard, so I leave something to my kids. And Rabbi Ephraim gave me a chidush, one of the scariest things I've ever heard. He says, many people leave, leave an inheritance to their kids. And you see, after the parent dies, the grandparent dies, and you see the kid. Now, if he didn't get the inheritance, if she didn't get the inheritance, what would they do? They get a regular job, go make a few thousand dollars every month, survive. So what do they do now? They have this inheritance. So you fast forward, oh, what's your grandkid going to look like? What's your kid going to look like with this inheritance that you worked so hard for 67 years to build? What's he going to look like? Okay, let's see. Flash forward. See on the screen. Doon, 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 doon. Kid, what's he doing? He's getting high in some club. That's what he's doing with the inheritance. He's high on every type of pill under the sun. His eyes over here and his eyes over here. He's half naked and he doesn't even realize it. His sister is right next to him, completely passed out on the, on, on the club floor. The other brother already died. The other sister is in jail. Everybody's completely cracked out. But hey, you left him an inheritance. And you know what you did? Rav Fahim says, your money bought all of their sins. And you're going to get punished for every single one of them. That inheritance that you gave to your secular kids, that inheritance that you gave to your non yirat shamayim children, you're going to get punished for it. Why? Because they're going to make sins with that money. And the person will get burned for every one of their sins. Why? You enable them to make sense. When a person understands that and has at least a little bit of Yirat Shammai, immediately he starts realizing either I'm just going to donate every single penny that I have to a yeshiva right now, to a place where I could actually build some Torah and have some real schuyot, or I could just pretty much pay my kids anything that they want just to go and learn from the best teachers in the world to learn how to have Yirat Shemayim. You know what the best answer is? Do both. Do both. Invest in Torah and invest in your kids. That's the answer. The word that everyone's waiting for as far as the guns and the bullets and the bombs and all that stuff, yeah, that's going to happen at some point. But that's not the most dangerous part. That's just the final part. Dangerous part is what's happening now.
The dangerous part is what already has been happening for a few generations, where the Erev Rav has focused all of their effort to confuse Am Yisrael by distorting the truth, by teaching things that are false, in order to numb you, so you don't have any Yirat Shemaim, so you get used to sinning, so you get used to doing whatever you want, you blame society for your problems, you distance yourself away from Hashem, and you become their slaves. That's what works. You don't have to worry about the Bilderbergers, and the Freemasons, and the, uh, the uh, Illuminati. You don't have to worry about those people. You have to worry about Hashem. Why? Because Hashem is the one that allows them to do what they're going to do. But that's only because of your action. If you produce Kedusha, holiness in the world, no one can touch you. No one. If you don't, don't complain. This is the next section, a scary one nonetheless, from the letter, that, from the Sefer that we have, from Arav Wasim and Allah Shalom. Yiratzon, that this too will wake us up to invest more in ourselves and our Torah, to invest more in our community, to invest more in teachers that have real Yirat Shemaim, to invest more in real Torah institutions, to stop pacifying ourselves by telling ourselves that, you know, something is better than nothing type of mentality. And to realize that the world's problems right now are not what you should be worried about. Don't spend so much time watching the news. Pray and do whatever you can to change tomorrow's news. Because today's news, there's nothing you can do about it. It's already old. What you can do is pray and take action to change tomorrow's news. Bezat Hashem, this too will help us take action to change tomorrow's news. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.